What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. This is the Two Smart Assets Podcast. I am your host, Danny Nichols, here once again with my co-host, Chris Thompson. What's going on, Danny? Good to see you, man. Man, good to see you, too. Got another great episode this week. What are we talking about? Man, last week, we talked to Todd Salzinger of Blue Elm Investments, and he gave us so much information and so much value that we thought it was best to just break this up into a two-part series. So today is part number two. If you missed the first part, just go back to last week. But this is part number two about uh, Todd's transition from the corporate finance world into uh, investing in mobile home parks passively and actively. We also talked about a lot of the pros and cons of, of the active side and the passive side and really why mobile home parks should be on every investor's radar. Every investor's radar. Can't wait to dive into this. But first, just want to give a quick shout out to all our listeners. We really appreciate you tuning in. If you haven't done so already, please make sure to subscribe to the show and leave us a rating and written review. It really helps us grow the podcast, attract more guests, and ultimately provide better information for everyone listening. And if you're a passive investor or looking to get into passive investing, then head over to our website at twosmartassets.com. There you can grab our guide for passive investing in apartment syndications. This is just a great introduction into the world of passive investing in apartment syndications. So make sure to check that out. Also grab our apartment syndication sample deal. This is going to help you get comfortable with looking at this type of investment. So when the real opportunities come your way, you'll be ready. And if you have any questions about what's in either of these resources, drop us a line anytime on our website's contact us page, or you can message us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. We're posting some great content on there, so make sure to follow us and start connecting. All right, now that we got that out of the way, let's transition into the show. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so Todd, we kind of want to we kind of want to dive into the the you know we've been talking a little bit about the, about the passive side, you know, passive investors, and we kind of transitioned a little bit into active side, but we kind of want to dive in a, a little bit more into that and hear a little bit more yeah. about your story about active and uh, you know being on the active side because you know we are passive <laughs> investors, but we're also looking to get into the active side as well, kind mm -hmm. of you know, more into that and, you know, uh, having our, having our limited knowledge of, um, uh, mobile home parks, I think is, uh, is one aspect. So we're definitely trying to learn yeah. more, but, um, tell us a little bit more about some of the challenges you face, you know, coming from corporate America and becoming an active syndicator, you know, what are those, some of those challenges you found in, you know, building your syndication business? Um, well, it's been, uh, I, I guess, the, you know, the challenge is pr probably similar to when you're like starting your own business of any sort, you know, always working for a company, working in finance, you have one role, you know, you know, you've got a CEO doing their thing, sales team teams doing their other thing, marketing teams doing their thing. When you're running your own business, you're doing everything. So that's been, it's been a great learning experience, but it is a challenge to kind of go from, okay, today I'm working on financial models on you know, mobile home park deals I'm looking at, and now I've got to write like a blog and a newsletter, then I've got to talk to investors, and I've got to you know, kind of, um, you know, create a compelling uh, slide deck to put on a webinar. So, um, so it's probably getting into areas that I hadn't, hadn't done before that has been, been a challenge, but it's been a super great learning experience. I love it. Yeah, I feel like it's like a way to like learn from the ground up, you know, begin on that first run, like you're putting together all these small little, you know, the, just the back end stuff. Uh, yeah, it's huge, huge base for your knowledge. Um, you touched on it like a, a little while ago, just a, 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 for a moment, but I was curious, like, what are you, like, <clears throat> what are you kind of, what are some of your like methods that you're using to find some of these off market deals or like to source the deals, you know, that you're having to thumb through? Yeah. I know you said you, you you're developing broker relationships. What else are you doing? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's broker relationships. There are a few um, brokers who specialize in mobile home parks. And then there's other commercial brokers that just uh, real estate brokers that every now and then uh, get uh, get listings for mobile home parks. So it's really kind of searching for those as well. Mm -hmm. And then um, through the consulting company I work for, they have access to quite a few off-market deals. And that often happens because they like I said, they manage around 80, 85 parks across the country and their clients are always buying and selling. Um, sometimes their clients don't really, aren't really actively selling. They don't want to put it on loop net or give it to a broker or, you know, to freak out the manager on site manager or anything. So they'll just uh, uh, come to uh, this company, CCI investments and just say, Hey, you know, why don't you just put this out to your network? And if somebody's interested in, in buying and I can get it at the right price, uh, I'll be willing to sell. 
so the, the park in Tennessee I actually purchased um, through them. It was some, you know, something that they found for, uh, through some other parks that they owned uh, in, the, in the town where I bought my park. So, um, so that, that's kind of one source of off-market deals. I haven't done the uh, cold calling to buyers, which is something that other people in this business do, just uh, whether, uh, whether it's either phone calls or possibly in their local market, just driving around to parks and trying to find the manager, the owner, and see if they'd be interested in selling. Uh, you know, one, I, th I thought, I guess, from a local standpoint that, you know, the pricing of mobile home parks in the Bay Area is just ridiculous. There was no way I was going to, uh, you know, stumble upon something here that might be a great deal. Um, and then from the cold calling standpoint, I uh, didn't think it'd be the best use of my time just to be on the phone all day making calls to hopefully get in contact with a potential seller to buy a park. So um, anyway, so it's again a kind of combination of uh, parks through um, CCI that would often come off market and then either mobile home park brokers or um, commercial brokers that often get listings. Awesome. Uh, so like how much, I, I'm curious and I, I think, I think I might know the answer, but I'm curious, like what's your, what's your role? Like when, when you guys are acquiring this stuff, uh, you know, especially investing out, out of state, you know, you're investing, you know, at range, uh, like, are you, are you involved? Like, did you fly, like, did you go to Georgia and Tennessee to like put your own boots on the ground to look at this stuff before you did it or? Was that remote? I did. That was that was part of the our uh, due diligence uh, through this uh, park was to go out there and make a site visit. So um, because I'd hired um, CCI to help me with the due diligence, uh, I, one of their representatives flew out to Georgia with me, and we spent a couple days. You know, we were on site at the park a couple times, um, and then did part, you know part of the due diligence we do through these parks is just to you know drive through the park in the morning, see what it looks like, drive through in the evening, you know during the day where all the cars gone because people are at work. That's a good sign, you know in the evening or people out, you know, drinking, making tons of noise, or does it seem like it's a kind of a quiet, nice park? Um, and we did things like we went to the police station in town and just said, hey, we're thinking of buying this park in town. Do you know anything about it? And literally, like, we walked in the door, talked to people, and they knew exactly the park we were talking about. Mm -hmm. They knew the owner's name. They kind of gave us, a, you know, some uh, stories about a few things that had happened there. Nothing serious in the past that uh, would have made us shy away, but um, they were totally open and honest about it. Went to code enforcement, went to their office and sat down with them and found out if there were any violations or any, any issues with the park. So um, yeah, so kind of doing that, uh, uh, that on-site visit was important. And also because I was uh, going to be selling this to investors, I wanted to spend a lot of time in the town, um, you know, taking pictures, drove by some of the bigger employers, um, just so I could say like, I've been there, I've seen the town, you know, the Lowe's was busy, the Walmart was busy, there's a carpet factory in town, there's a prison, there's all these, um, uh, you know, things happening that I would be able to uh, tell a better story because I've been there. Awesome. I think some of those, uh, like you're talking about, you know, just talking to people, going to going to code enforcement, seeing that place, like you know, in the morning, in the evening, you know, maybe in the daytime when the kids are getting home. I think those are pretty. To me, now they're obvious, but I think they're very <laughs> clever. They're very clever ways to kind of suss out how this thing is going. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I actually had another question. Like, uh, you know, when you're when you're walking around, when you're walking around the park and you're trying to decide you know, how good this may or may not be. There are certain things in my mind that might jump out as red flags, but I don't think they might be because you have experience with this now. Like, you know, like what, what would you say is a red flag uh, that would deter you from it? Because I know you're, we're aiming at, you know, mismanaged properties, stuff where we can improve, but what's something that you're like, no, that we're not good on that. Um, well, I, you know, I guess if we would have had a, like a really bad report from the police department that, you know, that may have said, hey, like this, not just the park is bad, but, you know, the entire surrounding neighborhoods are bad. Because sometimes if a park might not have a good tenant base, over time you can turn those around if the neighborhood is decent. But if the mm -hmm. um, surrounding neighborhood was also something that was really negative, that, that would have, um, uh, could have made us shy, made us shy away. Um, this park in Georgia was on city water and sewer, so that was good. You know, if it would have had a, a well or septic tank, and we, if, we, if that was the case, and we found some issues with, with that that may have, that we may not have been able to negotiate a better price right. to maybe cover the cost of repair. That could have been something that would have made us, uh, made us turn away. Uh, that's a, that's actually a pretty good point. You know, when you're going in, you're talking to, uh, talking to the local people, um, 
PD or whoever, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we, when we talk about like market selection a lot, uh, but like, what's like, what's the, like the slice of, uh, how do I put this? Like a general slice of like your clientele, the people who are going to be living in your place. You know, we, we're looking at big major employers that draw, that draw in, in, in employment, you know, especially, you know, with larger, uh, multifamily and stuff like yeah. that. And we, we want to check that diversity, but I realized we're aiming at affordable housing. And I was wondering like, what kind of employment, uh, uh, income criteria are you looking at that helps drive this investment home? Yeah, no, yeah, great question. That's kind of one thing interesting too about uh, what can be successful mobile home parks. They're not always in major metros. Again, if you were buying a hundred unit apartment versus a hundred unit or uh, hundred pad mobile home park, a hundred unit apartment is most likely going to be a bigger city, maybe a primary market or a secondary market. But there's a lot of smaller markets like this um, uh, park in Georgia. The city itself is about 55,000 people. So I know some people set 100,000 minimum population before they look at you know, any park whatsoever. Um, and that was a consideration when I uh, first saw uh, these parks, actually two parks about a mile from each other that we acquired. And But I, as I dug in a little bit deeper, I'm like, oh, interesting. Like I mentioned, there was a Lowe's in town and a, and a Walmart super center saying, so okay, like Lowe's, a Lowe's hardware, you know, home improvement store did all the research to say like, we've got enough business to uh, activity in this town and maybe not in, not just in the town itself, in the surrounding areas to keep the business going. And then again, looked at the, uh, uh, some of the different employers. There were like three, two universities in town and a junior college, um, I said I mentioned a prison, carpet manufacturer, um, uh, just some other, um, other engineering companies, companies you kind of never see when you're um, driving around Silicon Valley seeing software startups everywhere. Um, so I, so yeah, again, I was kind of looking for um, a diverse employer base that, um, that I knew if there was, you know, as, as there's turnover, that there would be demand to fill in the, uh, fill in the park as people moved out. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. I do have a question regarding we kind of, you know, we're talking about due diligence, you know, on site due diligence and also mm -hmm. market due diligence. Um, and we know being an active syndicator, um, or you're not doing this by yourself. Obviously, you have the consulting firm that you're working for, and they're, mm -hmm. they're a piece of this. Uh, in terms of team and building your team as a syndicator, what other pieces have, have you built for this? And how, how, how does that operate with your company? Sure, sure. Uh, well, like I said, definitely, I, you know, I leaned heavily on the, um, on CCI to help with the um, kind of experience in the mobile home park business. And, and they're uh, part of their consulting services is that after the deal closes, they, um, in addition to the kind of standard property management, collecting and collecting rent, paying bills, they also help with the turnaround. So, um, for example, there were um, some vacant lots in, in the parks, and they helped source some used refurbished mobile homes to fill the empty lots for us to rent out. Um, so that was something I, you know, I didn't do myself. They had the relationships, they made the phone calls, they kind of coordinated getting those, uh, getting those into place. Um, uh, in terms of kind of other team, uh, you know, it's really kind of the, in terms of putting a syndication together, you know, having a good syndication attorney is critical and then having a, a good CPA um, to help with K-1s and, and tax returns. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, uh, that's pretty fantastic. Um, in terms of, in terms of when you're putting together these syndications uh, as an active investor, what, what, so you're providing these to, you know, past investors, but what is uh, the typical um, base like hold period for this? What does that look like? Um, so for the parks in Georgia, we were planning on a five year hold. Um, and I, you know, I, 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 I'd seen that often in syndication deals. And the more I kind of was putting this deal together to me, that made sense. Cause it was like, Oh, you know, you know, two or three years might not be enough time to stabilize the park, turn it around, you know, whether you wanted to sell or refinance, it wouldn't be enough time. You know, if you tried to say, oh, we're going to hold the park for seven years or 10 years or forever, that would be too long for most people. So five years seemed to be a, a reasonable spot in the middle to say, okay, well, it's, it's um, turn the park around, you know, get it up to near full occupancy by the, by the third year have a you know, good full year of financials, then maybe start to market the park for sale and be able to sell it by year five. That's funny, you kind of you have it from both sides. Some people are like, oh, five years, okay, that's a long time to have my money tied up. And then I've, I've had other investors that say, oh gosh, if by year five, if, things, if this thing's returning 15% you know, a year, why would we ever sell this? 
um, but you can't really put together a syndication and just tell everybody, hey, we're never going to sell it. So <laughs> there has to be some kind of exit as part of the plan. It's kind of a hard sell, right? Right, right. Uh, I, I was actually curious, you know, uh, you know, I hear about some of the, e even just back down to the financing that sometimes that could be troublesome. And uh, I was curious, like, you know, between, between actual, uh, uh, you know, actual lenders versus, uh, you know, some uh, uh, seller financing, like, like what's your experience been like getting the financing or do you have any experience with dealing with the seller uh, without a lender? Um, yeah, that, that, that is more challenging to get financing on mobile home parks. Uh, you know, a lot of banks don't understand them as a business. Uh, you know, the mobile homes themselves are considered personal property, not real mm -hmm. property. So, um, you know, different than an equivalent, you know, maybe house or apartment. Uh, there are some banks that um, uh, maybe don't specialize in it, but have a decent size, amount of their loan portfolio in mobile home parks that understand that business a little bit better. When you get into bigger dollar size, I know when I was uh, talking to banks uh, before, as I was going through deal, due diligence on the parks in Georgia, uh, I talked to somebody at Wells Fargo and they were kind of in the, I think at the time, a million plus range loan wise and like a million and a half, I think maybe it's closer to a million and a half now, the entire purchase price for the parks in my parks in Georgia was just a little over 800,000. So yeah, I wasn't even gonna qualify to work with one of those bigger banks. Sure. So I was talking to a few of the, um, a couple local banks, and then this uh, one other bank who uh, has a decent amount of their portfolio in mobile home parks and was kind of going down that uh, path with them and had talked to the seller about doing seller financing and he didn't want to do it, you know, he didn't want to be involved with it, just wanted to sell the parks and move on. And through our due diligence process, one of the reasons why we've got a pretty good deal on this park was he wasn't accepting, uh, he was only accepting cash from his tenants. Um, so he didn't really have good records. His tax returns were kind of commingled with four or five different mobile home parks and another laundromat business he had. So through the process, we went back to him and said, this is going to be like really hard to finance. Like your records are a mess. You've got the list of your rent roll is on a spiral bound piece of paper that you check off as you come around and collect cash every month. Like that's not good. So, you know, we felt comfortable that the um, kind of the, the occupancy and income was what, what we expected it to be. So through that process, we uh, kind of convinced him eventually to do seller financing. So uh, we got great terms, like interest only for uh, four years with the ability to extend for another four years. Um, had to put up, uh, kind of turned out to be the equivalent of like 36% down. So uh, mm -hmm. some of the lenders we were talking to were uh, talking in the 30 to 35% range. So that was pretty close. So yeah, so that was, that was a, a good outcome to that, to be able to get seller financing. Do you think that uh, like his inability to keep, you know, really good, I'm, I don't know how good his records were, but you know, just being <laughs> decentralized and all over the place, do you think that forced his hand into, uh, do you think that could play a role? Like <clears throat> I, I could, in my mind, I could imagine that happening all over the place with mom and pop, you yeah. know, just it, it, not that they're not professional, but let's face it, you know, they just have their own way of doing things. Do you mm, think yeah. that could have a play into kind of strong arm in them into seller financing? Yeah, it can, because, you know, if we would have told the guy or, or any other seller would say, Hey, you know, to get this park really ready to sell that where somebody can get bank financing, you're going to have to, clean up your records, put things in QuickBooks, you know, split off into different LLCs, you know, do another tax return. That could be a year or two long process for them to kind of clean up their books. And some of them just don't have the, you know, energy or, or you know, you know, time or energy to want to do that. So mm -hmm. that can, you know, lead them down to say, okay, fine, I'll go do seller financing. And from their standpoint, again, every situation is different. Again, a lot of these sellers might not need the big cash out. They just don't want to deal with running it anymore. So it can be beneficial to them. Like in this case, uh, you know, the guy only took 35% down. So he only has to claim capital gains on the, on the cash he took versus having it all come at one hit. He's getting monthly loan payments, you know, and at worst case, if we defaulted, he takes back over a park that he, you know, he'd been running for the previous 15 years. So, um, so it's really, it's a, it's a good situation for the seller. And it's a win-win, huh? Win -win yeah, for everybody. yeah, absolutely. Right, 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 right. You know, I don't, and then, I don't know. Uh, oh, it was a convention. We got one other thing on the, on the bank financing side. Most of the parks that I 
uh, own our um, most of the park. The homes are owned by the park itself, and we and we rent them out. Um, you know, a lot of the industry really tries to focus on tenant-owned homes, where um, you know you just own the dirt and rent that out. And there's definite benefits to that in terms of lower maintenance and uh, tenant stickiness. Uh, but it really does also just depend on the market in terms of which markets are uh, which markets that work well in versus which markets are more renter markets and you can you know still make good money on owning the homes so uh, one of the issues with uh, some of the banks is that they'll often only loan on the income related to the lot rent so in the parks in georgia we might charge between 400 and 600 dollars a month rent for the home for somebody to live there kind of baked within that is a is a lot rent of 150 dollars. so depending on the bank they may only say hey you know we're not going to take any you can't take any credit for that income for the park owned for the kind of the home rental part of it just the lot rent um so so that can make financing a little bit more challenging when you're trying to split those apart or trying to make the numbers work in terms of the amount of income you can generate just for those lots right that makes sense uh, you know, I, I don't really want to jump around a whole lot, but I was actually curious, <clears throat> you know, during, you know, this entire year has kind of wrecked everyone. No, I won't say wrecked, yeah. but, you know, kind of <laughs> blindsided everyone, you know, and uh, and I was curious, you know, we hear about different, uh, uh, different operators uh, being able to uh, uh, kind of bend a little bit and kind of help their help their uh their clientele their renters their tenants and everything and i was curious like what uh if anything like what have you guys been able to do what are your management teams doing to kind of ease i mean we're in uh, affordable housing i'm sure a lot of those people are taking it right in the pants how are you how are you guys dealing with that yeah well you know as soon as this hit we um tried to reach out to our tenants as soon as possible and just say hey like you know there's you know kind of new rules in the park uh, you know uh, here's a new place to drop off your rent you know our um, on-site manager isn't going to be in the park as often in terms of collections or dealing with maintenance issues we had a we have a maintenance guy who lives uh, lives in the park so we kind of had to um create our own protocols around hey if you unless it's a real emergency um, you know, give us time to get to you and want to make sure when we come over that he's safe when he comes in to work on the house and that you can leave and keep things clean. So we kind of had to change some of our protocols from our, our current residents for some prospective uh, residents that were coming in to look at homes. Same thing, you know, before our uh, manager would go into the house and show, show up things around to them. This time, uh, you know, after the pandemic hit, they were just standing outside saying, okay, you go in the house, walk around, check things out come out and then the next person can come in so some of those procedures changed um, in terms of some of the residents themselves uh, we sent out letters to everybody as soon as it happened to say you know if, if you had if your employment's been affected by the by the pandemic let us know you know if you don't let us know and you're not paying rent we're just gonna have to follow our our standard procedures for eviction but if your job has been affected then let us know get a letter from your employer and then we'll try to work towards making a payment plan uh, that's perfect. That's that, that transparency. Let me know beforehand, you know, it's more yes, easy yes. to deal with. And I think they, they just recently actually came out with something about uh, current evictions, didn't they? Uh, about, you know, if, if you can show that your, um, you know, your job loss or your loss of income is related to, um, <clears throat> right. um, you know, the, the coronavirus or COVID, then, then obviously, you know, the eviction is basically halted until what they say, I think it's the end of the year or something like that. So. Right, 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 right. And we, we, we've been struggling in, in Georgia, you know, we had some of uh, you know, a few of our residents who did not you know, really make a case to prove that they are, they've been affected by the pandemic, but they also knew that the county that the parks were in were not accepting any eviction cases because they were, they, you know, they had a big backlog of things and the courts were closed. So they were like, hmm, okay. They can't evict me. All right. So um, that opened back up in July, but then now the courts have a big backlog and uh, some other counties are pushing court cases out even until uh, till the end of the year. So um, that's, you know, that, that's a struggle and just kind of part of uh, part of the business. Definitely brings hopefully, it. Hopefully this is something like this isn't going to really happen again in our lifetimes. Yeah. Oh gosh, I sure hope not. <laughs> it definitely brings a set of challenges, a new set of challenges. So it'd be be nice to get all this thing squared away. But in terms of you know, uh, you're going out and you know this, depending where we are in the mar the market cycle, you know things are kind of crazy right now. It's a little different, you know. But uh, in terms of going forward, are you guys still looking at deals? Are you still out there trying to invest? I mean, just trying to find those those good deals from the mom and pop owners. 
Um, you know, I, I haven't actively looked, you know, kind of really in the last maybe three or four months. I uh, bought a park in Tennessee. Um, actually, late last year, I, I bought it myself with the idea I was going to put it into a syndication. Um, uh, I started that process kind of in the beginning of March in terms of putting my business plan together and actually launched my webinar to you know, you know, put this out to my, my investor group two days before we went on lockdown here in California. So not great timing to, you know, to launch a deal. So that, that slowed things up a little bit. So I spent kind of the, you know, the, the summer, um, uh, you know, to kind of tweak the business plan a little bit and then closed on that at the beginning of July. So the next, I think I kind of see for the rest of this year, uh, a lot of my focus is going to be on, um, you know, helping with the parks in Georgia and then also really kicking off the turnaround for this park in Tennessee that um, that needs, you know, needs a lot of work. A lot of the, there's quite a few vacant homes. We need to bring in crews to rehab those and start marketing. We're fixing the roads, we're putting in new signage and doing some things to kind of, you know, spruce up the park and turn it around. Um, on the um, consulting business side, the CCI who I'm working for now, it's really interesting. There's um, a lot of activity from people who are, are calling into the office that say they want to buy parks directly. Sometimes it's individuals, sometimes it's partnerships or family offices that are, um, there's a lot of inbound track where people are saying, you know, I've been hearing about what a great business this, this, business this is. You guys are kind of experts in, in you know, helping people go through a turnaround process and, and find and manage parks, and we want to buy them. So I've been spending a lot of time uh, on the phone the last couple months working with prospective buyers trying to make that match and then help them with their turnaround. Well, it's good to hear you're staying busy during this time. It sounds like you got your, your hands full for sure. So <laughs> we definitely like to hear that. You know, and you know, we've covered a ton today, Todd. Actually, I'm going to have to go back and probably listen to this episode myself at least three or four <laughs> times just to absorb all the information, you know, because this is so oh, much. No, you guys are asking great, guys are asking great questions. So. <laughs> you know, it's, you're providing a ton of value. We really appreciate that. But, you know, we're kind of getting low on time here. But before we actually do run out of time, uh, Todd, we want to kind of sh shine the spotlight on you. So just tell us just what you have going on right now. Uh, sure. Yeah. Well, if anybody wants to reach out, like I said, I love to talk about mobile home parks and real estate investing and passive investing. I just, uh, like you mentioned in my intro, I'm just a firm believer that, you know, real estate is real, the, you know, the true tool to lead to long-term wealth. I'm not a big believer in the, in the stock market and I, uh, I believe in real, real tangible assets. So um, anybody can reach me at my email address, which is Todd, T-O-D-D, at Blue Elm Investments, or my website, uh, uh, www.blueelminvestments.com. Um, we've got a lot of information on there, blogs, if, if anybody wants to contact and get on my list to uh, get keep up with what I'm doing and some of the newsletters I'm putting out that, about what's happening either in the mobile home park business or real estate in general. And if there's anybody out there who's inter interested in acquiring a park directly or with their partnership group, um, I'd be happy to help them with that process as well. Awesome. Excellent. Excellent. That's, uh, that's a lot of great stuff. We'll make sure to direct everybody uh, to your websites and to get a hold of you through uh, the beans that you just um, you just said, we'll make sure to put that in the show notes. So um, yeah, it's man, it's been a great conversation, Todd. We really appreciate you coming. Yeah. On the show. Thanks, Chris Daniel. That was great. I really appreciate it. It was a good conversation and I look forward to doing it again sometime. Absolutely. For sure. All right, good so, luck uh, going forward. Really. Thank you very much. All right. So that's all we have for today to our listeners. Appreciate you tuning in. We'll see you next week.